Hi, it's Greg Dalton. I'd like to hear your comments on the show, topics we should cover, and guest suggestions. You can reach me at greg at climateone.org. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. Spreading climate misinformation is a favorite tool of fossil fuel companies looking to protect their bottom line. Whether they're arguing climate change isn't real, therefore we shouldn't act, or climate change isn't caused by humans, therefore we shouldn't act, or solutions won't work, therefore we shouldn't act. Companies use advertising and mass media to spread these messages and in some cases want to defend their actions as protected free speech. This idea that, you know, if it's something that connects to policy I want to see, then it doesn't have to play by the same rules. But we can counter these false arguments through critical thinking and education. If we want a public who are resilient against misinformation, we need to build up their uh, ability to spot these types of fallacies. Fossil fuel corporations have spent decades casting doubt in public about climate facts that their own scientists validated in company research. These tactics have included a concerted effort to recast political speech, banned and regulated in some contexts, as protected free speech, giving corporations more leeway in broadcasting their messages. This week's episode is a special collaboration with Amy Westervelt, an award-winning journalist and creator of the podcast Drilled. She brings us the backstory of the free speech argument fossil fuel companies are now using to support their efforts to spread climate misinformation. Most people think the debate over corporate free speech in America started with the Citizens United case in 2010. Mr. Olson, are you taking the position that there is no difference in the First Amendment rights of an individual? A corporation, after all, is not endowed by its creator with inalienable rights. So is there any distinction that Congress could draw between corporations and natural human beings for purposes of campaign finance. What the court has said in the First Amendment context, New York Times versus Sullivan, Grosjean versus Associated Press, and over and over again is that corporations are persons entitled to protection under the First Amendment. That was the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg questioning attorney Ted Olson with the firm Gibson Dunn, who argued and won that case. Just a quick recap here. The case was about a film that had been made criticizing Hillary Clinton the first time she tried to run for president. It was funded by a cohort of right-wing organizations and corporations, including Koch Industries. So the Federal Election Commission had said that the movie couldn't screen without identifying itself as campaign material and noting its funders. The filmmakers and their attorneys argued that this violated their free speech rights and they won, opening the door to unlimited corporate funding of political propaganda, what's generally referred to as simply dark money. But Citizens United was not the first battle in the war over corporate free speech, nor was it the last. The story actually begins back in the late 1960s with Mobile Oil and its issue advertising program. It was a multifaceted strategy that included defining a personality for mobile, aligning the company with cultural institutions, and advertising ideas rather than just gas. The strategy came from Mobile's VP of Public Affairs, Herb Schmertz, as a way to counter widespread criticism of oil companies in the press. And it was championed by the company's CEO, Raleigh Warner. Here's Schmertz later in life describing Mobile's personality. Well, it was multifaceted. Uh, it was a personality where we believed very strongly about the importance of public policy issues. Secondly, we believed fervently that as a sort of a custodial of a large corporation and as custodians of vast resources and employment and everything else, that we were not doing our job if we did not participate in the marketplace of ideas. Third part of our personality was we believed in that a democracy 
is composed of a group of free institutions. We believe in free markets, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, academic freedom, freedom to organize and participate in union activities. In addition to sponsoring Masterpiece Theater starting in 1970, Mobile worked with the New York Times to create the advertorial. Every week, Mobile ran a piece in the Times op-ed section espousing some idea or another. Here's Schmertz describing them on the show Open Mind. Herb, thanks for joining me today. Great pleasure to be here, Dick. I I want to turn as quickly as possible to a new fairy tale, the uh, Mobile ad or op-ed piece or editorial call or what you will that we call them pamphlets pamphlets but they appear in newspapers yes pamphlets but they appear in newspapers in the early 1970s schmertz and warner figured they were having such great luck with the newspaper advertorials and their various pbs specials that it was time to get mobile content onto commercial tv They reached out to CBS, ABC, and NBC to buy time, but got a surprise this time. CBS and ABC gave them an emphatic no. They described what Mobile was trying to do with their ads as propaganda and claimed it violated various ethics policies and maybe even some FCC laws. Schmertz went one by one to independent stations to place his TV advertorials instead. Here's a taste of one of them. From the Mobile Information Center... Good evening, I'm Dick Callanan. Most Americans have an exaggerated idea about oil company profits. Warner and Schmertz went on the offensive in general, too. They wrote letters to the network heads. They placed multiple New York Times advertorials about how the big TV networks were trying to silence them. And they gave speeches at various business groups about how this was a huge threat to corporate rights. It was the first time any company had talked about such a thing as corporate free speech. The 70s, there was a lot of public opinion um, that they would have been concerned about. This is Robert Kerr, a media law professor and researcher at Oklahoma State University. He's written two books about the evolution of corporate free speech and Mobile's role in it. He's talking here about the situation that oil companies found themselves in during the early 70s. There had been the big high-profile oil spill in California in 1969, and then in 1973, the oil embargo hit. In response to the U.S. support of Israel during the Arab-Israeli war, Arab members of OPEC put a ban on exporting oil to the U.S. The effect was immediate. You know, I lived through that, and I remember it was, people were scared all of a sudden, you know, this uh, something that they were used to going to the pump and a gas pump and getting for almost nothing uh, was not only going way up in price, but, um, you know, you might not even be able to buy gas. And, and often you couldn't in the right. 70s. The, the gas stations would run out of, uh, or, or you'd have a really long line, you'd wait for hours, or, and then, then maybe you still couldn't buy any. So, yeah, the public was um, really alarmed and, um, uh, particularly the Carter administration in the late 70s um, seemed to be a lot less um, uh, favorable toward the oil companies in general. You know, Jimmy Carter and his administration um, seemed willing to hold their feet to the fire. Anger and bewilderment are growing as more and more Americans cope with gasoline lines and empty pumps. <laughs> Good evening. For millions of Americans, this may be the worst weekend they've ever faced for finding gasoline to give them the automobile freedom they take as their due. Gasoline shortages are spreading across the country. Odd even service, gasoline lines, and closed gas stations are becoming increasingly common. And the news from overseas tonight gives no promise of quick relief. People were scared and angry, and a lot of those emotions were being directed at oil companies. For Mobile, access to the press and the ability to get out its version of the story was critical to the company's ability to weather this storm. And that refusal from the commercial stations to run its ads, that was a huge potential threat to that strategy. Mobile toyed with the idea of filing a case themselves that would formally establish the corporate right to free speech, but it worried that that could backfire. 
Instead, the company started filing amicus briefs in other cases. And Mobile was one of the leading corporations to fight for that legal right. This is Dr. Robert Brule, an environmental sociologist at Brown University. There was a, a pretty big effort to get a Supreme Court ruling that basically supported corporate speech and the right of corporations to do advertising of their, not just product, product advertising, but of their, you know, positions. That Supreme Court case he's talking about was First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti. First National, along with two other banks and three corporations, had wanted to spend money to publicize their opposition to a ballot initiative that would permit Massachusetts to implement a graduated income tax. The Attorney General of Massachusetts said that violated a state law against funding campaigns that would influence the outcome of a vote. The bank sued, and the case went to the Supreme Court in 1977. The ruling came out in 1978. Here's Supreme Court Justice Lewis A. Powell giving that ruling. The First Amendment's primary concern, and therefore the court's concern, always has been the preservation of free and uninhibited dissemination of information and ideas. If the restrictive view of corporate speech taken by the Massachusetts court were accepted, government would have the power to deprive society of the views of corporations. Powell is also credited with crafting the Powell Memorandum, which outlined the pro-corporate strategy that would guide the Republican Party from the early 1980s to today. Bilotti is generally considered the precursor to Citizens United, and Mobile was hugely influential in securing that ruling. Here's Robert Kerr again. You know, it, it actually was very close when it first got to the Supreme Court. The justices could have gone the other way. Justice Powell kind of really finessed mm -hmm. it and got that first precedent-setting case, Bilotti, into, into the case law. And then later, when it got to Citizens United, Justice Kennedy kind of ignores the overall body of case law, and he goes back to Bilotti uh, 24 times. It's really unusual to cite one case 24 times. So why does this matter today? Well, in addition to changing public discourse forever, these cases also laid the groundwork for the argument that oil companies are using today to defend climate disinformation. In some two dozen climate liability cases and some additional fraud cases, the oil companies are being accused with misleading the public on climate. The lawyer appointed to speak for all of the companies in these cases is Ted Boutros, who's not only a well-known First Amendment attorney, but also a partner at Gibson Dunn, the firm that secured that win in Citizens United back in 2010. Here's Boutros speaking on the Climate One podcast in 2020. I do want to take head on the notion that the plaintiff's lawyers in a lot of the climate change cases have been advocating is that the oil and gas companies were, they had secret knowledge and they were then putting out, you know, misinformation and, and they tried to analogize it to tobacco and other areas. It just, it doesn't make any sense because it was well known. The federal government knew the problems of climate change, the, the potential causes and knew that there was an issue here. Other attorneys are making this argument on behalf of the oil majors as well. When it exhausted all options to dismiss the fraud case against it in Massachusetts, ExxonMobil filed an anti-slap suit against the attorney general's office there, claiming that the fraud case against it amounted to an effort to quash the company's First Amendment rights. SLAP stands for Strategic Litigation Against Public Participation. Anti-slap statutes like the one in Massachusetts were meant to protect the press and civil society groups from corporations that wanted to silence critics. But these days, it's become equally common for corporations to use these statutes to swat away legal complaints. Here's attorney Justin Anderson, a partner with Paul Weiss, that's ExxonMobil's law firm, at a March 2022 hearing. The alleged misrepresentations are the statements that ExxonMobil has made about its views on climate policy, on energy policy. The anti-slap statute provides a mechanism to have a case that is brought against someone for petitioning activity dismissed at the outset before burdensome discovery is imposed on the party, before we have our executives come in to give testimony and depositions, before we're dragged into a courtroom where we have to defend ourselves. 
that phrase petitioning activity is really key here because what it means in plain English is political speech. And the argument ExxonMobil is making here and that Boutros has been making as well is that because the oil company's campaigns on climate are political speech, not commercial speech, they are protected by the First Amendment. It's the sort of argument Herb Schmertz would have been proud of. Here he is defending corporate PR in the 80s. Government intrusion into the marketplace of ideas would limit our freedom of speech and distort the selection of our leaders. People feel frustrated when the press doesn't deliver a complete story or an accurate story, so they, they bring in people who have the ability to add to the spectrum of uh, facts, opinions, views, philosophies, so that the public can get a, a, a more uh, balanced view. Today, the groundwork that Schmertz and Warner laid with Bilotti, various other cases with issue advertising, and with their general advocacy for corporate free speech over the decades is the foundation for Big Oil's argument about climate denial. It couldn't be fraud. It was political speech, protected by the free speech rights they've spent the past 50 years securing. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about tactics for spreading climate misinformation. Coming up, one way to break down misleading reasoning. You can just take a flawed argument and transplant that logic into a parallel situation, usually the most absurd and extreme situation you can think of, and then use the same logic. And that makes it very clear uh, and engaging and concrete when you're trying to explain the flawed logic to people. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton, and today we're talking about climate misinformation and how to challenge it. John Cook is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Climate Change Communication Research Hub at Monash University in Australia. He focuses on using critical thinking to build resilience against misinformation. He says the most common climate misinformation in the U.S. centers on climate policy being harmful, expensive, or ineffective. Ultimately, its goal is to delay climate action and maintain the status quo. And you will find that no matter what the argument is, the conclusion is always the same. Whether they're arguing climate change isn't real, therefore we shouldn't act, or climate change isn't caused by humans, therefore we shouldn't act, or solutions won't work, therefore we shouldn't act. It's always that that end thing. And so it's about delaying action by reducing public support for climate action. And there there are various pathways to do that. One is confusing people about the science. There's a famous 2002 memo written by a political strategist, Frank Luntz, where he basically argued for politicians who were trying to win the public debate about climate policy, he said, if you want to win the debate about climate policy and and basically stop climate action, cast doubt on the scientific consensus that humans are causing global warming. If the public get confused about the consensus, their attitudes about the policy change accordingly. Right, which harkens that uh, confusion and doubt, of course, goes back to the tobacco company saying, you know, doubt is our product. There's been a decades-long effort by oil companies and others to cast doubt on climate science to allow them to continue to profit. The strategy's taken many forms and evolved over time. Can you walk us through that evolution from deny, dismiss, delay, deflect? Yeah, there has been a a gradual shift. We've done an analysis of the last 20 years of climate misinformation, and the biggest shift we're seeing is a gradual transition from science misinformation to solutions misinformation. As the scientific evidence has gotten stronger and stronger and harder to deny, it becomes untenable to keep using these same zombie arguments that we've been reading on blogs and on social media for many years. Uh, And so now they're arguing against climate solutions, arguing that climate policy might be harmful, arguing that uh, renewables won't work, uh, and just more subtle arguments than the usual climate change is a hoax type misinformation. Right. That's no longer tenable in a world where there's floods and fires that are rampant. I think what's most potent right now is 
culture war type misinformation, argument that other people who care about climate change, who, who are trying to get climate action, uh, painting them as different to us and they're trying to take away our lifestyle or impinge on our freedom and generally just trying to make the climate issue more tribal. The more tribal and polarized it becomes, the harder it is to get progress. And some of the techniques employed by misinformation you cite are magnified minority, cherry picking, false dichotomy. How are those employed? And give some examples of each one if you could. So attacking the scientific consensus on climate change has been a common uh, strategy over the last well, few decades. And one way to do that is the use of magnified minority. In other words, take a small group and make them look much bigger than they actually are and much more significant than they really are. And the most popular version of this technique is the Global Warming Petition Project. This is a website that features 31,000 science graduates in the US who've signed a statement saying that humans aren't disrupting climate. And the point of this website is to say, hey, look, 31,000 people dissent against the consensus that proves that there isn't a scientific consensus. But when you look at the total number of science graduates in the US, it's millions and millions. And 31,000, while seeming like a big number, is actually a tiny fraction of a percent. It's, it's magnifying a minority to make them look bigger than they really are. Mm -hmm. So policy is harmful. What's that attack? Usually arguing that climate policy is harmful takes a form of arguing that it's either going to ruin the economy or raise prices for people. And uh, it really depends on the specific policy. But typically what this does is um, cherry picks or oversimplifies the policy. For example, uh, this is a very Australian-centric one, but it's the one that immediately comes to mind. We brought in a carbon price in order to send a signal to the market to transition from fossil fuels to renewables. Uh, and this carbon price generated revenue for the government, but all that money was then given back. Uh, and it was mainly given back to lower income families. And so it was a revenue neutral carbon price. The, the public shouldn't have any change in their household budget. But what the, um, the misinformation targeting the policy did was say, this is putting a price on carbon, that's going to raise prices for families while ignoring that that money was going back to families. So usually attacks on climate policy will focus on one part of it, but ignore the, the entire policy and, and the aspects of it that make it work better. And what are some other non-policy attacks on solutions? The most basic arguments attacking renewables are the sun doesn't shine at night or the wind doesn't always blow and therefore renewables aren't a reliable source of, of energy, which ignores, again, it, it's cherry picking the information because it ignores the fact that uh, we have battery storage. And also when you have combinations of wind and solar, particularly across a region, uh, wind might not be blowing in one place, but it is at a different place. And when you have a, a network of renewables, then you get a more reliable source of uh, energy. And then false dichotomy, what's an example of that? False dichotomy is when you're given two choices and you have to choose one of them when both might be true or maybe there's a third choice. And the most common example of this in climate change, uh, and this is a little bit technical and complicated, but it's looking at the ice core record. When we look at uh, ice cores going back hundreds of thousands of years, in Antarctic ice cores, we see that when temperature goes up, CO2 goes up afterwards by several hundred years, roughly. Uh, and what that tells us is temperature went up before the CO2. Uh, and climate deniers look at this and say, well, either temperature drives CO2 or CO2 drives temperature. You have to choose one or the other. But that's actually a false dichotomy because it's not a choice between one or the other, both are actually true. Temperature does drive CO2. When it gets warmer, the ocean gives up CO2 into the atmosphere. 
And then when you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, that causes warming because it's a greenhouse gas. Uh, put those two together and you get a reinforcing feedback. And it's actually that reinforcing feedback that pulled the Earth out of ice ages in, in our past over the last 800,000 years. John, you've also written about how people often substitute judgment about complex topics such as climate science with more simple judgments, for example, the character or tribal identity of a person talking about climate science. How does that reliance on shortcuts fuel climate ins misinformation? Yeah, it's important to recognize that all of us are hardwired to make decisions based on snap mental shortcuts or heuristics. And generally, it serves us well. It's how we're able to escape a saber-toothed tiger jumping out of the bushes or, um, you know, just immediate threats. Uh, the problem is in this modern world, sometimes those mental shortcuts can lead us astray and it can also make us vulnerable to um, bad arguments or misinformation. And it's, it's an unfortunate reality that the solution to this problem is critical thinking. We need to be able to get better at spotting misinformation and the spotting attempts to mislead us. What are those different fallacies? Is this argument uh, a false dichotomy or does it use um, magnified minority or cherry picking or other misleading techniques? If we want a public who are resilient against misinformation, we need to, to build up their uh, ability to spot these types of fallacies. Right. And sort of complexity can, yeah, we want things, especially these days, we want things that are fast, simple, understandable, and social media often distorts in doing that and distilling things. And I was watching some of your videos online of you kind of dissecting the premise and does the conclusion logically follow the premise? And it all seemed very reasonable. And I thought, yeah, but this is like bringing a knife to a gunfight when, <laughs> when so I'm just curious about your sort of very reasoned approach logic-based in an information age where things are viral and fake and spreading so quickly regardless of their veracity. Yeah, it's it's really hard. I've I've struggled with those thoughts and for many years. When we develop this critical thinking approach where you deconstruct arguments into premises and conclusion, I did that work with two critical thinking philosophers. They introduced me to the idea of parallel argumentation. You can explain logical flaws by not, you don't have to go into the whole premise, premise, conclusion, logical, um, like is it logically valid, all that kind of analysis. You can just take a flawed argument and transplant that logic into a parallel situation, usually the most absurd and extreme situation you can think of, and then use the same logic. And that makes it very clear uh, and engaging and concrete when you're trying to explain the flawed logic to people. And when they introduced this technique to me, I realized that this was what late night comedians use every night. They'll say, this person said this statement, and well, that's just like being in this situation and then using the same logic. Everyone laughs, they can immediately see that it's wrong uh, and they're entertained. But, but most importantly, like he's, the the comedian has actually introduced a bit of critical thinking because it's shown a logical fallacy in a very concrete, engaging way. The beauty of this approach is you can use non-polarizing examples to explain how misinformation is misleading or to, or to explain a fallacy. So let's uh, practice this. If I say that the climate's changed before, it's changing now, it's always been changing. Yeah, climate changes, that's what it does. How would you respond? That argument is the same logic as saying, well, people have died of natural causes before cigarettes were invented. Uh, therefore, cigarettes can't cause harmful effects. Or people have died of cancer long before cigarettes were invented. Therefore, smoking doesn't cause cancer. It's the same logic, and it c commits single cause fallacy. In other words, saying that whatever's cause, whatever caused something in the past must also be causing it now, when you can have multiple causes. Let's try another one. If I say that models are unreliable, oh, climate models, ugh, they're not accurate. So actually, we're doing an experiment on that now. Uh, and so our approach has been to say models are a simplification of reality. They don't, they don't capture all of reality. Uh, 
And we use models to get astronauts to the moon. Uh, they're simplified versions of reality. Newton's laws of motion and Newton's laws of gravity are simplifications. Models don't need to be perfect in order to give us useful results. Uh, and climate models, they're not perfect. They don't capture absolutely everything, but they capture enough to tell us that humans are causing climate change and that climate change has serious impacts. Many fossil fuel companies now are engaging in what some call greenwashing or climate washing, where they're making net zero commitments and stating that they're working toward climate solutions. You mentioned earlier they're attacking solutions. There's other approach, which is they're kind of co-opting solutions, saying we share the solutions, we're part of the solution. Yes, uh, greenwashing is another form of climate misinformation, uh, particularly from industry. Uh, and it's a hard one. Uh, often you need a lot of background information in order to fact check whether what they're doing is actually helping the environment or whether it's just token behavior in order to portray themselves as being environmental when actually they're, they're actually being quite destructive. But the, generally speaking, the strategy to counter greenwashing is the same as the strategy to counter other forms of climate misinformation. Learn the techniques and become familiar with them so that when you see them, in some corporate advertising, that's a red flag. The techniques of greenwashing, and just a few of them that come immediately to mind, is vague terms or um, kind of meaningless terms. So they'll say it's environmentally friendly or they'll, they'll just use uh, either colors or imagery or environmental sounding words, but it's all very loosey-goosey. The other red flag is when they're a company that their main bread and butter of their business is environmentally destructive, and then they talk about something that they're doing that's environmentally positive. Usually in those cases, what they're spending on this environmental uh, activity is a tiny, tiny fraction of their overall budget. Yeah, that's the magnified minority. We're spending millions on renewables, but they're spending tens of billions on on fossil fuels. Um, Amy Westervelt reported elsewhere in this show that freedom of speech is often viewed as sacrosanct. We all know that and has been used by fossil fuel companies as cover for their misinformation campaigns. What are the bigger implications of that in terms of free speech? It really depends on the specific situation, but generally speaking, my, my policy or my approach is the antidote to bad speech is more speech or good speech. Uh, and and that is kind of the principle that informs building public resilience against misinformation. So helping people to see through these false arguments from fossil fuel companies or other sources of misinformation. Right, and we've seen lots of attacks on on science, and there seems to be you know it's related to the distrust of institutions, and that's certainly been rampant during COVID-19 pandemic and has led to real harm and even death of some some vocal anti-vaxxers. Have you done research on whether personal experience, does that affect people's uh, receptivity to these myths if they know someone who's been affected by climate or know someone who's been affected by, by COVID? There's some interesting research done by my colleagues at George Mason University, uh, Theresa Myers and Ed Maybach. They looked at how personal experience can influence people's perceptions about climate change. And the way to think about it is, imagine there's three segments of society. There's the alarmed and concerned, people who are, who are on board about climate change. There's the dismissives at the other end. And then there's the uh, mushy middle. There's the undecideds in the middle. What they found was, Personal experience about climate change doesn't affect the two groups at the ends. The people who are alarmed stay alarmed. The people who are dismissive stay dismissive. It's the people who are undecided in the middle. When they have personal experience with climate-related events like increasing extreme weather, those are the ones whose perceptions about climate change shift. You work with Facebook to help them combat misinformation. What does that work look like, particularly in the climate realm? So Facebook launched the Climate Science Center, and initially the Climate Science Center was just about providing authoritative, reliable 
accurate facts about climate change. And this was done in response to a lot of criticism they received about letting misinformation spread on their platform. And a lot of people were critical that this was not enough, including myself. I didn't have any association with them at the time, so I was quite blunt in saying producing facts while letting misinformation spread was like poisoning someone and then giving them a pamphlet about vegetables. Um, but uh, to their credit, they they always recognised that just producing the Climate Science Centre was a first step and they their intent was to uh, gradually ratchet up their ambition and proactiveness in taking on climate misinformation. So their next step was to work with um, myself and two other climate um, communication researchers, Tony Leisowitz and Sandra Vanderlinden, and we went through the process of looking at the most common myths about climate change, and then we advised them on how to write debunkings about them. It's important when you're debunking misinformation not just to explain the facts, although that's crucially important, but also to explain the technique used to distort the facts. Uh, so fact, myth, fallacy, fact is a general structure that we recommend for debunking misinformation, and they use that. So we produced those with them, um, debunking the most common myths about climate change. Uh, since then, it's been an ongoing collaboration, and they're still looking at other ways to, to use their platform to counter misinformation. It's been slow, slow, slower than I would have liked, but there has been incremental progress. Misinformation is a really complicated problem. It involves psychology, culture, technology, um, science, like a whole range of different factors, and we need to be throwing a lot of different um, tools at it. John Cook, thanks for sharing your insights on how to identify misinformation and how to respond to the misinformation. Thanks, Greg. It was great to talk to you. Coming up, the implications of podcasts not being regulated the same way as other types of media. Every person who's putting out a podcast, is it's up to them entirely what their process is for fact-checking or any kind of backstop there on truthfulness. And we've really seen in the last few years what that can lead to. That's up next when Climate One continues. We're talking about climate misinformation. This week's show is a special collaboration with Amy Westervelt, an award-winning print and audio journalist. She's founder of the Critical Frequency Podcast Network, which includes her own show, Drilled, a true crime style podcast about climate change. I asked her to join me to reflect on what we've heard so far in this show about ways fossil fuel companies spread misinformation. Amy, welcome to Climate One. I'm excited to be talking with you. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, reflecting on your piece that opened this episode, it was real interesting. And I've been thinking about the distinction between commercial speech and political speech. You know, fossil fuels have amazing energy density and they enable us to live our lives every day. And fossil fuels are killing the natural systems that we rely on every day. Both are true. Where do you see the line between commercial speech and political speech that you talked about in that opening segment? Yeah, I mean, I find that really interesting too, just from a, a legal strategy standpoint, this idea that, you know, if it's something that connects to policy I want to see, then it doesn't have to play by the same rules as, you know, something that's about a product that I'm selling. Um, so to me, I actually, it, it reminds me of the conversation that sprung up when The Guardian stopped taking fossil fuel ads a couple mm -hmm. years ago. So a lot of people kind of questioned that and said, well, you know, where do you draw the line? What about airplanes and air travel and cars? And if it has to do with with climate change and 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 or a product's impact on you know, the environment or the world at large, you, you could theoretically just get rid of, of any kind of advertiser. And they had this very succinct response to that, which was, well, all of those other categories are selling a product and the fossil fuel industry is very much selling ideas and policy positions. They don't advertise gas anymore. Nobody really chooses their gasoline based on brand, right? It's a commodity. So to me, there's a very, very clear difference between 
the way that the fossil fuel industry advertises for the last 10, 15 years and the way most other industries advertise. That is a pretty good illustration of the difference between commercial and political speech. Right. And then that advertising often gets into its branding. And, it, you know, another part of your segment that was real interesting is mobile VP of public affairs, formerly Herb Schmertz, remarking on the company's personality and its participation in the marketplace of ideas. Of course, these days, corporations are often invited into public discourse by partisans and advocates. Disney just called for rescinding Florida's don't say gay law, which I, I said, yay. Yeah. Yeah, so oil companies are not the only ones shaping their image and in, in the public policy sphere. So right. you know, why is it bad for oil companies to do what Disney is and others are doing? I personally believe it's not great for any of them to do it, um, actually. <laughs> Whether we agree with them or not um, is sort of irrelevant. I think the invitation to corporations into the public square has been a real problem in America since the 70s. <laughs> and I think that you see this, right, in this history of um, mobile kind of involving itself with this, that it was very much like we need to maintain this position in society to be able to effectively um, lobby both the public and politicians for these um, kinds of policies that we want to control the narrative about what's happening, you know, with our industry. It's actually a really interesting time to be talking about this because very similar things were happening then that are happening now <laughs> where, you know, the gas prices were high and the oil companies were saying it's not our fault, it's the government's fault. And there was this kind of, you know, jockeying for for control of the story. When I heard that piece that you did, I thought of, you know, the status of corporations as individuals, as legal individuals, which is kind of another extension of what you pointed out. They have First Amendment rights and they are they are an individual, which made me think immediately of Stephen Colbert's line a while back where he said, I'll believe that corporations are individuals when Texas executes one. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, Herb Schmert's whole personality thing really played into that, too. This idea of like, oh, if we imbue corporations with a personality and a, um, an opinion and a soul, like a morality, too, right, then that makes it easier for us to convince the public that, you know, we're we're good faith actors. We care about more than just our bottom line. But the reality is that that they don't have to play by the same rules as any other member of the community. You know, nobody else gets as many benefits as as corporations do in in the realm of where they're not humans. And I'm curious, you know, you also we had John Cook uh, talking about deconstructing climate myths, how to identify and respond to misinformation. What struck you about his piece? I find him so interesting every time I, I read anything of his or or listen to him talk about this stuff. Um, so the thing that struck me this time was this notion. And I don't it wasn't necessarily new to me, but just the way he phrased it as, you know, we had like 20 years of science denial and then 20 years of solutions denial. It's a very um, straightforward way to understand it. And you really have seen that over over the years of, you know, OK, now we believe the science, like let's focus on these other things that will help us delay policy and regulation and, you know, allow us to kind of get as much out of these assets as we can before we have to retire them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is the name of the game. And I'm not, like, to be honest, I don't, I don't necessarily blame oil companies for doing that. They're doing what corporations are encouraged and incentivized and enabled to mm -hmm. do, right? right? So so I am kind of of the opinion of, well, if we want it to change, then we have to change the rules so that, you know, they they can't do these things that are beneficial to them and kind of impose a lot of liabilities and risks on the rest of us. The idea of kind of solutions, that, that also for me was really clarifying and crystallizing when John said we've moved from climate misinformation to solutions misinformation. It made me think of how many times I've heard people question what happens to EV batteries after the useful life of the car? And I've heard that so many times that I'm suspicious of where that's being seeded and, and, and how that's being seeded. Like, it, did those people all come up with that organically? Or, you know, is there some, you know, Facebook post somewhere that campaigned to like sow doubt about EV batteries at the end of life? And we know that 
that right. is a solvable problem. And now there's a new company that's going to harv by a founder of Tesla that's going to try to harvest those batteries, et cetera. Yeah, it's but it's it's I don't know. It's so tough because I think there are important and nuanced conversations to be had about, um, you know, some of the the unintended consequences of the solutions to climate change too, right? Like I know there's a whole, a lot going on around lithium mining right now. Mm, and, huge. Yeah. You know, those are, are very important conversations to be having. We don't want to go into, you know, the next energy generation with the same exact mindset, except for like the source of energy or else we're going to repeat, you know, the same mistakes and end up with a new problem. Right. And, and unfortunately, it's like you almost can't have those conversations without it being weaponized by you know people who who don't want to see climate policy or who don't want to see energy transition to say oh look see there you know there's problems with this too there's problems with all of it the other thing i thought was interesting in um your interview with john where he talks about how there's a real focus on kind of weaponizing the human tendency towards tribal identity and uh, and sticking with our group and digging into our opinions and those kinds of things because you really see that in the fracturing of the climate movement too not just like climate people versus people who don't think we should act on climate or centrists versus progressives or whatever like even in these things like should we or should we not mine lithium for electrification <laughs> it's like people can't even have you know, a remotely nuanced conversation about it. And, you know, a lot of this is, is playing out in, in the, the podcasting place. And there was a big dust up recently with, you know, Joe Rogan. He's been peddling in both climate and COVID misinformation for a long time, but it's COVID that got him in trouble. And yeah. then you tweeted recently that you know, he interviewed Michael Schellenberger, who I've interviewed numerous times, uh, who's running for the governor of California. So how does he embody kind of the the evolution from science misinformation to solution information. And what did you think about when you saw Rogan and Schellenberger together, that photo? It was so interesting because I had just I was just listening to your conversation with John. And then I saw that that, you know, interview had happened. And I was like, oh, this is like a perfect example of this of this evolution. Cause Joe Rogan has, you know, interviewed lots of kind of garden variety climate deniers, you know, who will say, actually, carb CO2 is good for us in the atmosphere and things of that nature. And now he's graduated to Schellenberger, you know, mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. is, you know, is a likes likes to kind of burnish his environmental credentials and say, I was an environmental activist and and now I'm apologizing to the world for all of the alarmism that we created about climate change. And yes, it's a problem, but we don't need to actually make any drastic changes. And very, very much a big user of, of one of the strategies that John Cook talked about, which is cherry picking data mm -hmm, points. Mm -hmm. I went through his book when it came out and um, found, I think, 3,000 examples of... <laughs> <laughs> cherry picked data that was like making a very flawed argument. So how much of this is, you know, you and I both came out of, you know, traditional news backgrounds. You know, when I worked at the AP, there was a saying that if you think your mother loves you, you better call and confirm that it's still true, you know? And so <laughs> yeah. you know, the, you know, but in, in pod land in the realm of podcasts, which are, you know, those traditional rules, rules don't apply. They're regulated differently. So how, you know, talk about, you know, how much of this is a, a real fu function of, you know, the, the, th the surge of podcasting and how can pod land avoid becoming the cesspool that is social media? Yeah. I'm, I'm actually very concerned about this because it, it is governed by the exact same rules as Twitter and Facebook. So uh, podcasts are, but I think the public thinks of podcasts as being media, right? Um, and therefore governed by media rules, like uh -huh. websites or newspapers or whatever. And it's just, it's not actually. Um, so every person who's putting out a podcast is it's up to them entirely what their process is for fact checking or you know i mean there are some some basic consumer protection laws but in terms of um any kind of 
backstop there on truthfulness. Uh, no, it's kind of up to to each organization. And, and we've really seen in the last few years what that can lead to. Joe Rogan is a perfect example of, you know, he kind of takes this approach that, well, I'm just I'm just sharing my opinion. And the problem there is that when you're sharing your opinion and it sounds like expertise, then it can be very misleading to people, you know? Um, so maybe I, he, I, he I, learned from yeah. mobile oil. Maybe he took a page from the yeah, Herb Schmerz. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that, you know, I'm not a fan of censorship. And um, I think also like the horse is kind of out of the barn. Like you're not going to, you know, go back in time and set up rules that the podcast industry can, you know, <laughs> can uh, live by necessarily. But I do think that um, there's an argument to be made to bring podcasts under FCC regulations instead of the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, which it's under now. Not that the FCC is perfect. Obviously, we see tons of misinformation on cable news, for example, as well. But there's at least some amount of more um, proactive action to try to curb that there. And the other thing is, I do think that you're seeing the industry itself start to sort of take some somewhat of a turn. You're always going to have these kind of rogue actors, but the podcast platforms are thinking about, you know, what can we do to sort of let the the more high quality reported stuff rise to the top and highlight that stuff versus some guy in his mom's garage, you know, and companies are starting to hire fact checkers more and more too. This has like become just in the last couple of years, I've seen a major, major shift where I had to really convince people before that that was worth spending money on. But because of the FTC thing, the other problem with podcasts is that the ads don't go by the same rules. So we've, we've struggled with that. How, yeah, how do you like fact check the ads that come on your platform? The daily got called out for some things on, yep. on, on natural gas. I think it was that, that uh, was not quite meet the standards of the New York times. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The fact that you saw this explosion in oil companies in particular advertising and podcasts a few years ago, it's for a reason, you know, they don't, they don't spend money on stuff just to try things out. They're, they're very smart and very strategic. So if, you know, if they're investing a lot there and in social media ads, it's because they have more control over the story there. Right. Which all gets to the need for this educated, discerning public to sort of, you know, check ourselves. And that what's the difference between the editorial, the, the podcast, the advertisement? Yeah. One of the themes running through this is the narrative of personal responsibility, both for climate action and for, I guess, for, for the information we take in versus corporate responsibility for corporate responsibility for climate, corporate responsibility or producer responsibility for media and for, for energy. Uh, you know, BP popularized the idea of the personal carbon footprint 20 years ago. And I respect your work a lot. And you have really gone after, you know, the villains, energy companies, energy suppliers as villains in, in the climate story. And and I've also pursued the limitations and, and the truth of the personal responsibility. And I want to play a clip from Britt Ray, who's a researcher at Stanford University, who's had this to say. It's, it's a huge part of a lot of activist rhetoric that we shouldn't be focusing on our individual minuscule impacts in relation to who's out there really spreading the damage, you know, the fossil fuel companies, the corrupt politicians, the lobbyists, et cetera, that are fueling the damage as we speak and have been for decades. And I really think that that is, of course, true on an intellectual level in many ways. But there's also perhaps a propulsion to turn away from looking within because it brings up shame, it brings up guilt, it brings up intolerable emotions that produce a bunch of defensive reactions. That's Britt Ray, who, who has a PhD in uh, climate science communication. So I'm going to ask you as someone, can villainization sometimes be easier than looking at ourselves and our own complicity? I definitely think it can be. And I also agree with Brit. And I also think that there's 
again, <laughs> going to sound like a broken record here, like a real need for nuance in the conversation around personal responsibility, because the reality is that, you know, the, the top 10% of consumers globally, which most Americans fall into, are responsible for a much larger proportion of global CO2 emissions than everyone else in the world, right? So I absolutely think that we should look at that and take responsibility for, you know, the ways that we're, you know, contributing to that. I also think just as a human, it feels better to live according to your values than not, <laughs> you know, on a, on a real basic level. And I think also that there's something to be said for individual action beyond consumerism. This is something that like really bugs me that the the personal responsibility stuff always gets boiled down to what we buy, right? Or how we travel, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like individual action can also be civic action. It can be political organizing. It can be finding ways to uh, make your community more resilient. It can be mutual aid. There are lots and lots and lots of things that have nothing to do with buying different stuff that are individual actions that are very important and that are a critical part of how we not only address this problem, but actually survive it. <laughs> you know? Right. And as, yeah, as Bill McKibben said to me years ago, the most important thing an individual can do is not act as an individual. And I'm increasingly thinking about the best thing you can do is have relationships and make this part of your life and your yes. relationships, whoever those relationships are with, to make climate part of it. Yeah. And I know um, Catherine Hayhoe talks a lot about the the power of talking to other people about this, not just in the vein of, you know, persuading people to see your point of view or things like that, but just to create community to like actually to to help with processing those feelings of shame and fear and anxiety and grief and all of those things that come up with this too. Like you, you can't do that alone. You need you need to talk to people, you know, but you speaking to someone else about it can absolutely help them to feel more like they're able to kind of work through that stuff and get to a place where they're, they can act. To me, it's actually not about finding villains at all. It's about figuring out what the, what drove a problem like the, the climate crisis in the first place. Like how do you have a society that allows a small group of people to make decisions that impact the whole world? Um, <laughs> You know, like, how, how does that happen? How does it get to this point where we're facing this catastrophe and everyone feels really powerless to do anything about it? You know, so that is interesting to me. I'm like, who, you know, how did this system get built and who built it and why did they have the power to build it? And how do we because to, for me, I don't think you get to effective solutions if you don't understand that. How do you solve a problem when you don't even know the roots of it or where it came from? We have to deal with the power structure, not just the power source. Ooh, yeah, right. It is ultimately about power. Yeah, well, Amy Westerville, thank you so much for coming on Climate One. It's a real, been a real pleasure and honor. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. On this Climate One, we've been breaking down climate misinformation tactics and ways to respond. Special thanks to Amy Westervelt for this collaboration. Check out her excellent podcast, Drilled. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard, difficult, depressing, awkward, and it's critical to addressing the climate emergency. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review or tell a friend. It really does help advance the climate conversation. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Our team also includes Arnab Gupta, Steve Fox, and Tyler Reed. Our theme music was composed by George Young and arranged by Matt Wilcox. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>